I'm Patrick Brunden. I'm Professor of Neuroscience at Lund University in Sweden. I'm also directing research at the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan, USA. Why did you become a scientist? It's pretty simple. When I was 12, my father was diagnosed with Parkinson's, so this was the driving force. And then when I was 17, I did uh, what's called an extended essay for the equivalent of an A-level degree. It was an international baccalaureate, required a, one to do an extended essay. I did that at Cardiff University Hospital on Parkinson's and uh, almost never looked back. If you had to describe your research in 30 seconds, what would you say? I work with brain repair strategies for Parkinson's disease, such as cell transplantation, but I'm also very interested in understanding how the disease develops. Uh, my primary interest there is looking at a protein that forms clumps in the cells and how this might move from one cell to another, this odd protein clump, in a prion-like fashion. That's it. 24 seconds. That was superb. As you say, you've got six seconds to talk about whatever you want. <laughs> So wh why is your research so important? I hope it's important because I hope it can help patients. So I hope that the cell transplants will one day become, if not a routine therapy, at least a widespread therapy for those who have already been afflicted. Secondly, I hope that this uh, study of the protein clumps will lead us to the discovery of a, a drug that inhibits the spreading of the protein clumps. If we succeed in doing that, maybe we could inhibit the disease when it's in its early stages. So moving, projecting into the future here, in your lifetime, what do you believe Parkinson's research will accomplish? Depends a little bit on how long I live. I met somebody who was 99 years old on, on Thursday and I was looking back at his career. He'd lived for so long and I thought, gosh, he's been through a lot of things. But if I live to be 99, I hope certainly that stem cell based therapies where one transplants stem cell derived neurons will be, be a routine uh, thing. I hope that there will be medications within the next decade that slow down the disease progression. And finally, I think we'll be able to predict who's going to get Parkinson's disease. Eventually, we, we do various tests and we figure out who they are and they'll be treated before they are afflicted by the disease. I think that's... Uh very good. And one of the, the words which I noted that you're not using, either deliberately or otherwise, is cure. If I had to put you on the spot and, uh, and said you can answer as, uh, as openly or as, uh, as you wish on this, if you had to define it for yourself, what is a cure for Parkinson's? I would say the best way to develop a cure would be to find out who's going to get the disease before they have it and then develop an intervention that actually stops it before it's started killing cells. I think once cells are dead it's going to be very difficult to cure the disease and we can, we can certainly ameliorate it by putting in new cells but it's never going to be possible to replace all the cells that are affected. Looking back on your research so far, and as I said, it's still, uh, whether or not you live to be 99 or whatever, it's still probably early days. In, in your own research, if you had to put your finger on it, what, what particular piece of your own research are you most proud of? I think without a doubt there are two pieces I'm particularly proud of. One is being part of the first team to transplant tissue into a Parkinson patient successfully back in the early 90s. Without a doubt, that's very exciting. Uh, the other one is, I think, being part of the whole evolving story of the prion-like behavior of a protein in Parkinson's disease, uh, being one of the first people involved in, in putting forward this hypothesis and driving some of the experiments around this. That's very exciting. Turning it back, I said you, you're back at the university, just about to start out on a research career. With the knowledge that you have now, having rewound the tape, what would you do differently? Oh, that's a difficult one. I ended up doing my uh, research in the middle of, in middle of my medical school, and I, I would still have done that, I think. I think that was a good time, being very young and uh, having no other things in life to think about. Uh, and then I went back and finished my clinical degree, and. Uh, I was about to specialize as a neurologist, but at that point I got the opportunity to start a research group. 
maybe I would have liked to have done my neurology first, but that would have taken five years, and I don't think I could practice neurology and do research at the front line. So maybe I wouldn't have changed that so much. Um, it's so difficult to answer that because it's so much context dependent. Today I would have liked to have done more molecular biology than I, I did back then, but there was no molecular biology to do, so, so definitely that's something I would have liked to have done. There's a lot talked about the role of patients in research, uh, rather than simply being as subjects, as uh, being increasingly participatory. Do you have any th thoughts particularly on that? I think it's very valuable. I think uh, if one looks at Parkinson's disease, what we, the research community and the clinicians community, have failed to do is recognise what symptoms really trouble patients. And I think that's a good example of of why patients should have a, a louder voice and a louder say. And also I think patients should have something to say about which clinical trials are really worth doing. Uh, sometimes the medical community is overly critical of certain types of clinical trials and if the patients had a say they might support them instead. So I'm all for it and I think uh, the Parkinson community is becoming louder and speaking out and I think the Huntington's disease community is a good role model where they've been at the forefront right from the beginning when it came to identifying the gene and looking at therapies they've been very very strong they've been sponsoring the research. In many respects the role model that, uh, that kind of we're using is the AIDS community ah, which is highly well it's, it's politicized which mm. is perhaps a negative mm. But it's a highly motivated, mm. um, highly organised mm. community, and in terms of patient involvement mm. and patient recruitment, patient engagement mm. as, uh, as much as anything else. If you had a, wanted to say anything specifically, uh, standing on a soapbox to the Parkinson's community, and by that I mean the predominantly the patients, but also the carers, the researchers, uh, the clinicians. Uh, a manifesto, if you could say anything to them, what would you tell them? I'd say that never in history has there been greater hope than there is today for Parkinson's disease. It doesn't mean that there's going to be a cure in five years or ten years, but it just means that we've never known as much as we know today and the speed at which the research is developing is just incredible. So, you know, there is a great chance that something will pop up. The other thing I think one has to say, it's very difficult to predict exactly what is going to work or what's going to pop up. If one looks historically, some of the thing, things people have done are systematic types of projects, but some of it is just serendipity, and we, we should also be poised to seize the moment when this comes up. I, I think that's, that's very refreshing to hear. I often put my own condition in context by saying that, that when people ask me uh, about it, and I say that, that actually there has never been a better time to have Parkinson's no, that's than right. now. That's right. And I think that's, that's true. Patrick, that was wonderful. Thank <laughs> you. I think we've got some great stuff. So I can walk the dogs. <laughs>